science writer Hope Jaron shares an interesting fact about plants, especially about how a tiny seed starts to put down roots, the most essential thing for a plant's survival. And she writes this, no risk is more terrifying than taking, than taking by the first root. A lucky root will eventually find water, but its first job is to anchor. Once the first root is extended, the plant will never again enjoy any hope of relocating to a place less cold, less dry, less dangerous. Indeed, it will face frost, drought, and greedy jaws without any possibility of flight. She calls taking root a big gamble, but if the seed takes root, it can go down 12, 30, 40 meters, and the results of that are powerful. A tree's roots can swell and split bedrock, and they can move many gallons of water daily for years, much more efficiently than any pump yet invented by man. If the root take root, then the plant becomes all but indestructible. Tear apart everything above the ground, everything, and most plants can still rebelliously grow back from just one intact root, more than once, more than twice. Folks, you and I are blessed because our faith is rooted in Jesus Christ, and there's nothing in this world that can take Jesus away from us. We can choose to turn away from Jesus. If we do that, even Jesus will continue even to come back to us, but we are blessed, not only us here, that everyone in the world who's accepted Jesus. We are rooted to our faith by Jesus. We are one big family. One big family because of Christ, all kind of living under this tent of salvation that he has made possible for us. And when we publicly claim our baptism, we're in a sense saying, you know what? We are all part of this family. We're joining God's family. And we're acknowledging that God is working on the inside of us, shaping and changing us so that we become more and more like Jesus. When we, with our free will, choose Jesus as our Savior, as our Redeemer, we are indeed rooted. Rooted the way that God wants us to be rooted. And when we spiritually allow those spiritual roots to grow, to sink in, go down 30, 40, 100 meters, then we get to the really good godly stuff, right? The really, really good godly stuff. Unlike the illustration where the writer said that it's a gamble for the root uh, to start out, to, Jesus is not a gamble at all. In Jesus, we have the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the answer. And because we are baptized into the family of God through what Christ has done for us, we, you and I, have the opportunity to live a baptized life. Right here in the middle of the world that we live in, right here in the middle of everything that's going on, right here in the middle with our friends and family, we can live a baptized life. Today, I want to talk a little bit about that baptized life. I want to look at the scriptures See what kind of advice we can get for maybe living that baptized life. At the end of our scripture reading from this morning, it says this, this water, it's speaking of the water uh, during the flood, symbolizes baptism that now saves you and I. Here's the key part. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience towards God we can have a clear conscience towards God. Jesus made that possible. Because of that, we are all included in God's bigger family, and that makes us special. Nothing that we did, but through Christ, we are a part of God's bigger family. Now, like all families, it's better if when we're in this family, we're all striving to do what's right, we're all striving to listen to the leader of the family so that we're all going in the right direction. One thing we have as an advantage for us is we have God as the head of our family. Unlike some of us earthly leaders of the family who mess up, God never messes up. So if we listen to God as the leader of our family, we should be getting some good advice. We should be able to live well in this world. So 
Let's look at God's word today. Let's see what it says to us about living baptized life, some good advice from God. I want to lift up four things that I see from the scriptures. There's many more probably, but these are the four things that I want to talk about. The first one comes from verses 13 through 15a that says this, who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats, do not be frightened, but in your hearts revere Christ as Lord. So, when I was looking at that particular scripture, I gleaned that, this from that. If we want to live a baptized life in this world, it may require us to persevere. We may have to persevere for sure in this world. We also probably need to make sure that we're not fearful of what's going on. See, folks, there are some of God's children out there who are not yet members of the family of God who are just not very friendly to us Jesus folks. It's just simply the truth. There are some out there who want to do everything they can to get us off track, to, uh, to make us maybe look bad, or just to irritate us. They are hostile towards Jesus and all things Jesus. We need to recognize that, first of all, we need to persevere against that, and we need to not be afraid of that, okay? Secondly, I think if we're trying to live a baptized life, we also need to recognize that the church and the influence of the church has become less and less. We are becoming less and less relevant in this world, and we need to persevere against that. We need to maintain our voice and we can't be afraid of that. Living a baptized life, I think that's one of the realities that we have to recognize and do something about. Persevere and not be afraid. Finally, if we want to live a baptized life, I think it's important that we always strive to do what is good as much as possible. Paul speaks of this in Colossians 3 when he says this, Set your mind on things above and not on earthly things. We, as baptized members of God's family, have to strive to do that. How do we do that? Paul goes on, clothe ourselves in compassion, kindness, and humility. Practice gentleness and patience. Bear with each other. Forgive each other as God has forgiven us. And in all that we do, surround everything with love. Now, these are just some of the things I see from this particular scripture that we need to do. We need to persevere and we need to not have fear about these things. Living the baptized life requires us to do that. Second thing I see that comes from the scripture is kind of self evident and it comes from verse 15b. Uh, 15 it says this. Always be prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. As a baptized member of Christ's bigger family, you and I, we have responsibilities. We do. Like any kind of family that we may be a part of, we have chores to do, so to speak. One of those things is that God has a plan for you and I. He has a plan for sinners like you and I, sinners saved by God's grace. God wants us to take a part in his redemptive plan for the world. Can you imagine that? He really does. Jesus tells us of this plan. In Matthew 28, when he says this, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Here's our part. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always till the end of the age. One of the chores that we have to do as a member of God's bigger family is that we, as baptized members of that family, need to bring other folks into that family. We need to do our part to get them baptized into God's family too. This is God's plan. This is the way that God has designed things. It's one of the chores that you and I have to do. It's the Great Commission. One of the ways, just one of the ways that we do that is we have to be prepared. We have to be prepared to give an answer. An answer for the hope that we have. The hope that we have found in Jesus. We have to be able to talk about that. 
And we're talking about heavenly hope, not earthly hope. Many, many folks out there are searching for hope. Many, many folks. Unfortunately, many of them are looking for hope on earthly terms. We're not talking about that. We're talking about heavenly hope. We need to make sure that we understand the difference. We need to talk about the difference. People are confused. They are confused when it comes to hope because they're looking for worldly hope. And there's many, many distractions promising that hope. Buy a new car. You know, get a new snowmobile, whatever. There's all kinds of distractions saying this is how you find hope. The world is confusing people. We, as the church, have also not been doing a very good job when it comes to preaching about the hope that we have in Christ. It's about you and I talking to our neighbors and telling them and showing them that hope. It doesn't come from here. It comes from you folks. And we, as a church, need to be prepared to talk to that hope at all times. That's what God wants us to do. We need to do a better job at it, and we need to continue at it. We want to live the baptized life. The second part of this particular scripture uh, is where I think I find the third point of advice that I want to talk about. And the, third, the second part of the scripture says, do this with gentleness and respect. Living the baptized life, we need to lean on gentleness and respect. And of course, that makes sense when we're talking to folks on the outside. But you know what? <laughs> it also makes sense when we're talking to folks on the inside. Right? People that are already members of, of God's church, for sure. Um, folks, we're all in one big family. And like all families, we don't all get along, do we? We all have things. We all have issues. We don't play well together at times. Now, I'm just talking our church. I'm talking the bigger church. We don't. We have sibling rivalries. We have power struggles. We have generational issues. Fights have been going on for generations. And sometimes we just don't deal with them. We just don't look at them. Inside the big church and the little church, we have folks struggling, trying to find a clear conscience with God. The scripture says we should have that. Inside the big church and the little church, we have folks struggling to maintain a clear conscience with God. Inside the church, that we enter into baptism with these words, we proclaim to accept the freedom and the power God gives us to resist evil injustice and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves, we enter into the church with those words, and yet sometimes we fall victim to those very forces, don't we? Inside the church, we need to be uh, gentle and we need to be kind for all those things. After all, we're all human. We all make mistakes. And the church, the big church, indeed, our church, is filled up with people as quoted from a guy named Morton Kelsey that says this about the church. The church is not a museum for saints, but a hospital for sinners. I love that line. <laughs> We're not a museum of saints. None of us are. This is a hospital for sinners, right? So of course, we're gonna be uh, dealing with some problems. We need to make sure that uh, we are gentle and respectful inside the church. The same goes, obviously, for dealing with folks on the outside, people who are not members of God's family yet. I don't believe God wants us to be beating our, beating our neighbors over the head with our beliefs. I just don't believe God wants us to do that. We definitely need to share. We definitely need to boldly proclaim Christ and all that Christ is, but we have to do it in a manner that's helpful we need to take it very, very serious because we are talking of people's very souls. We're talking of their eternal lives. So there has to be a sense of urgency. There has to be a sense that we need to do this. But we have to be gentle about it. We have to be kind about it. Because in the end, it's only God who can change a heart. We can do our part, but God has to do the heavy lifting. God has to open up the heart so it can receive Jesus. We need to be gentle, we need to be kind, we need to make sure that we keep 
a clear conscience when we're doing all these things. We have a role and God has a role. Our baptized life tells us that we have a role to play and we need to do that. Gentle, kindness, and keeping a clear conscience. Finally, from this scripture, uh, if we want to try to live the baptized life, we're going to run into some things. We're going to run into some opposition. I believe we can see that. We, baptized believers, are living in a world filled up with all kinds of other spiritual forces around us. Non-godly spiritual forces. The Apostle Paul speaks of it in Ephesians 6, 12, when he says this about our struggle. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. We, as baptized members of God's family, need to recognize that and we need to deal with it. How do we deal with it? One way I see from the scripture reading this morning comes from verse 16. Keep a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. That's one of the ways we can do it. Make sure that we keep a clear conscience. Now, what does that mean? If you have somebody speaking against you, speaking against what you're proclaiming in Christ, and they're doing it in such a manner that the world calls you to reach out, to revenge, to take your pound of flesh, don't do that. Don't do that. That's what the world says. We need to turn the other cheek. We need to do something like maybe smile, maybe pray for them. And remember that just as it says in Proverbs 25, when we do that, it's like we're pouring coals on their head, right? Right? Don't push back. Revenge is for the Lord. Revenge is not for you and I. We need to make sure that we keep a clear conscience in the middle of these things. Okay? Additionally, we want to uh, uh, deal with spiritual forces in the world. We have to recognize occasionally, I think, from the Scripture it's going to call us to sacrifice. There's going to be some sacrifice. Verse 17, For it is better, if it is God's will, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. How in the world are we supposed to do that? How are we supposed to look when we're doing that? Well, we're supposed to look to Jesus. A little later in the scripture it says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. And if God, and Jesus can suffer, you, certainly you and I should consider that we might have to suffer sometime in the future too. Just the way that it is with the baptized life. Just the way it is as we're members of God's family. Now, all these things we've been talking about today... They've been uh, things that I've lifted up from the scripture, things that I see that uh, we might be required to do if we're going to be living as a baptized member of God's family. There's, there's others for sure, but let's just review a little bit. I see from the scripture this morning that if we're going to be baptized members of God's family, we need to probably persevere, and we also need to make sure that we're not living in fear. Okay? We need to recognize that we have responsibilities. We're supposed to reach out and help with God's redemptive plan. One of the ways we do that is we testify about the hope that we have. And we're prepared to do that at all times. Thirdly, as we do that, we make sure that we do it with gentleness and respect. Both inside the church and outside the church. Why? Because it says so here in the Bible, right? Fourthly, we are dealing with some forces in the world that we don't understand. Some spiritual forces. We have to recognize that. We have to do what we can against that. God has to do the heavy lifting. And we have to recognize that we might be called to sacrifice. That's what I see from this morning's scripture. But here's the really good news. The really good news is when we consider those things and many other things, many other things that are involved with being a member of God's family, we need to also recognize that as a member of God's family, you and I and all the people in the world, we're all part of God's victory. God has this figured out. In the end, God is going to be victorious. And we're a part of that victory because of what Jesus has made possible. Victory is assured. 
Praise be to God that is assured. And because of that, because we know that, we know it in our hearts, we know it in our souls, you and I can live the baptized life. We are free to do that. We are free to bring the good news to all the people in the world who are struggling, who are struggling with life's trails, life's trip, because sometimes we know that trail gets very, very rough. God wants you and I being there, helping those folks who may be struggling on that. What might that look like? Well, it might look like many things. I think it'll look different for every one of us. Let me share an illustration that might uh, show what it might look like. It comes from an article in the Chicago Tribune by uh, a guy named Chris Erksine. He says this, By any measure, the Pacific Crest Trail is a beastly thing, an angry anaconda that slivers up the entire length of California and all the way to Canada, some 2,650 rugged miles. That's approximately 6 million steps, some of them glorious, many of them merciless. Sounds like life, doesn't it? I love that part. Countless rugged miles, more steps than you can count, some glorious, some merciless. The Tribune article focuses on the people on that trail who take it upon themselves to help the hikers who are hiking on that trail. They open up their homes to the weary travelers, provide meals, mail service, and help. They are called trail angels. The article says this, but along the way, mercy is at hand, trail angels, that would be a good, the trail angels are available. And then it goes on to say, that would be a good description of what Christians interacting with others in the world should be called. Trail angels, right? I like that. The article focused on a lady named Donna and her husband who set up tents in a trailer to handle the spring crush. She calls her home hiker heaven. According to the article, she talks fondly about the payoffs of being a trail angel. She witnesses hikers emerging uh, huma humanity, their grit, and the inevitable bearing of their souls. Traveling the trail is humbling. Traveling life can be humbling also, right? I compare it to peeling an onion, she says. You see people for what they really are. She says is, it's kind of like you, the way you see them in church. She and her husband will host 1,200 people in 2015 in an ordinary home. They don't take any money. She says, I always say that these people coming into my home are like a river of life that washes up to my shore. And she says, I love it when her sanctuary is filled with hikers and the sound of conversations mingling with music and laughter are divine to my ear. I just thought that was a neat article and a neat way for people to live a baptized life in the middle of the world. Folks, you and I, as baptized members of God's bigger family, also have the opportunity to affect the life that washes up on our shores. In that night visual, we do, we can. God wants us to be there on the shore for those people. God is counting on us being on the shore for those people. And when we are there, God works through us. It's not about us. It's about what God can do through us. We have the opportunity to affect those people, to help in God's redemptive plan for all those people who wash up on our shores. God wants everybody back in this family. He's using you and I as an instrument to do that now. As we live our baptized life, we have that opportunity. We have the opportunity to share with all of God's children in this world. I invite you to do that as we live out our lives in Christ. Amen.